Thank you all for coming. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and a real honor to be uh, speaking. Really, my first speaking engagement in London, public speaking engagement in London, under the uh, it's a real honor to be under the auspices of the uh, Anna Smith Institute. Uh, so thank you for for inviting me. There are still seats up front, and I promise I don't bite. So um, <laughs> feel free to to uh, I think you'll be more comfortable seated. Uh, these are uh, these are very difficult times to be defenders of capitalism, to be defenders of uh, free markets. Uh, I get asked all the time, Yuan, how can you continue to defend free markets? How can you continue to defend capitalism given everything that's happened? Uh, hasn't hasn't what's happened over the last eighteen months proved that capitalism and free markets do not work? And I look at them and I say, what are you talking about? What free markets? What capitalism? When do you see free markets and capitalism that have failed? Because we understand free capitalism to mean, or free markets and capitalism to mean, no government intervention in the economy. If we understand capitalism to mean a system of government where the government serves to protect and defend individual rights, to defend us against force and against fraud, but basically leaves us as individuals to contract and negotiate and transact voluntarily with one another, then where is this capitalism that was practiced and then failed? Because that's what capitalism means, and I think one of the, one of the most important things those of us who defend capitalism need to do is clearly define our terms. We didn't have capitalism 18 months ago. We didn't have free markets 18 months ago. We had elements of freedom, we had elements of capitalism, but we had lots of elements of state intervention in those markets. Heavy, heavy elements of state intervention. So first, we need to define our terms. Capitalism has not failed. Something failed, but it didn't <coughs> capitalism. What failed, is the mixture that we have, the mixture of the regulatory state, the mixture of socialism and capitalism, the mixed economy has indeed failed. And to those of us defending capitalism, that is not a surprise at all. So I think the first thing we have to do is, is, is protect our terms, protect our definitions, protect what it is that we mean by capitalism. And let's look at what actually failed. What actually caused this financial crisis? Is it the element of capitalism, the element of freedom, the little bit of freedom that exists in the, in the financial and, and generally in the markets that has destroyed our economy? Or is it the mixture of regulation and the mixture of, of state intervention that has caused this crisis? And I think when one looks at the actual facts, the sequence of events that have led to the crisis that we face today, it becomes quite a, quite obvious indeed that what has led to the crisis we fail, face today is government, government intervention. Primarily, I would argue, the role that the central banks have played. Of course, um, the very existence, in my view, I take a radical position here, the very existence of a central bank is evidence we don't have capitalism. I mean, a bank that sets interest rates for all of us. The interest rates are a pretty complicated price to set. Uh, you know, in the Soviet Union, they try to set the price of bread, right? And they always got it wrong. It was either too high, and what happens when it's too hot? You get too much of something. Or, more common, they set the price too low, and then what happens? You get too little of it, and you, you have those lines outside Right? So people trying to get the bread because there was so little of it, and prices don't adjust, supply and demand never match. So a bunch of bureaucrats in the Soviet Union sat around the table and figured, what should be the price of bread today? And they got that wrong. And bread is a relatively simple commodity. It's a relatively simple product. Interest rates are far more complicated than bread. And yet, in the United States, we trust 12 members of the Federal Reserve to sit around the table and decide, what should interest rates be today? And supply supplies. 
they get it wrong almost every time. And if you want the source of this current crisis, I would take you back to 2003, when in their wisdom, the Federal Reserve in the United States, and I know less about what the Bank of England was doing, but I suspect uh, something very similar. The Federal Reserve, in, in their, in their uh, wisdom, lowered interest rates to 1%. When inflation, the, the funds rate, the rate at which banks borrow and lend from one another, where inflation was at 3 4%. So the rate of interest was negative. The real rate of interest was negative. Now, what happens when a rate of interest is negative? Everybody borrows money. You're, so, you're stupid if you don't. They're paying you to borrow money. They're begging you to borrow money. So everybody borrows money. And indeed, if you look at the increase in credit coming out of 2003 all the way through 2005, 2006, it goes through the roof. People are borrowing money by homes. People are borrowing money on their credit cards. People, corporations were borrowing money. Everybody was leveraging. The investment banks went from 12 to 1 leverage to 40 to 1 leverage. Why not when money is almost free? And if this crisis is about anything, this crisis is fundamentally about too much leverage, too much debt, too much credit. And when you borrow that credit at basically 1, 2, 3 percent, and then suddenly the Federal Reserve jacks interest rates up, right? They underprice it and then they overprice it, up to 5 and a quarter percent in, in the steepest increase of interest rates in, I think, U.S. history from 2000, you know, starting 2005 to 2006, then suddenly something you could afford when interest rates one percent, you can't afford anymore when interest rates are five and a quarter percent. Suddenly people start defaulting on their mortgages and on their other debt. So this crisis, without any question, is a classical Austrian economics, Hayek and von Mises and economists like that would have predicted this case of, of Bad monetary policy. Now, there's necessarily anything, you know, any, any such thing as good monetary policy. Uh, I'm not a big believer in monetary policy, but this is clearly a case of off monetary. Now, if you add on to that, this notion of uh, housing policy in the United States, the fact that it's part of the American dream to own a home, an American dream that's been encouraged by every president since FDR, since the 1930s. Whole institutions were created in the United States to help Americans achieve the American dream at whatever cost was necessary, including subsidizing their mortgages, encouraging banks to lend money even to people who the banks themselves knew couldn't pay the money back, but in order to gain political capital, if you will, to gain political favors, they did it anyway because they were, you know, they were asked to and in some cases required to by, by, by legislation. Freddie and Fannie, which were subsidizing Freddie Mac, and Fannie Mae, which were subsidizing mortgages. Um, and just a bully pulpit, President Bush in 2003 was in Atlanta telling everybody that uh, housing was the American dream, and his administration would make sure that everybody who wanted a house could buy a house in America. And indeed, home ownership in the U.S. went from 65% to 70% in a very short period of time. Does anybody could get a subsidized mortgage at very low rates. The banks weren't asking for anything in terms of documentation. Prices were going up because, you know, a good classic asset bubble. The Fed was printing money. The money was going into home prices. Prices were going up. Everybody felt great until interest rates started going up again. So the cause of this crisis, not only do we not have a free market, not only can, it cannot be capitalism because there wasn't, Capitalism. But if you look at the elements within our mixed economy that caused this crisis, the elements clearly that caused the crisis are the governmental elements, the elements of the regulatory state, the elements of central banking and, and all the various regulations in the, in, the, in the U.S. over the banking industry and over housing policy. I don't think that anybody looking at the data honestly can come to any other so to me, the more interesting question, rather than what caused this crisis, to me, the more interesting question is why, as a culture in the U.S. And, and certainly in Europe, why are we so eager to 
to blame capitalism. Fall, fall. Why are we so eager to blame the bankers? I, I think every single financial or economic crisis in the last thousand years has been blamed on bankers. I think the only difference is in the old days, they used to blame it on Jewish bankers, now they dropped the Jewish, because it's not politically correct anymore to blame it on Jews. So, but it's, it's the bankers. The bankers have always been at fault somehow uh, on these crises. Why is it that we're so eager, so enthusiastic almost? You can see it, you, you can see the commentators on TV that, that, you know, they're foaming, they're so excited about this wonderful opportunity to go after capitalism, and people support it. You know, in America, if you followed the elections, the recent election, you know, Obama and McCain competed with one another. Who could be the most aggressive um, candidate to blame the financial crisis on Wall Street, on capitalism, on the banks? There was no free markets, pro-banking, pro-market candidates in the U.S. this last election. But Obama won out because he was more effective in blaming the crisis. And, you know, because, and, and to a large extent, because he was not Bush and wasn't associated with Bush in any way as McCain was. And, you know, one day he's charismatic. Uh, he doesn't say much, but he says it with passion. What he doesn't say, he says with passion. Um, <laughs> in, 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 a, in an engaging kind of way. And, and the truth is that Americans truly did want change. And to some extent, they didn't care what change it was. So why is it? Why are we so eager uh, to blame capital? And I think this is really where um, Ayn Rand, I, I'm just curious, uh, show of hands, how many of you have read something by Ayn Rand? It's almost um, this is Ayn Rand's real, I think, innovation, is, is, in, is in identifying the cultural, philosophical, moral roots of the antagonism uh, towards capitalism. Um, why is it that people are so eager? to blame business, to blame capitalism, to blame the bankers. And I think the reason is that capitalism is inherently selfish. People under capitalism are pursuing their own self-interest. A businessman can hide behind the mantra of what they do benefits society and everybody's better off if they make a lot of money. But bottom line is when they get up in the morning and go to work, they're going to work to make Money. For whom? For themselves. For their share. Capitalists, everybody really under capitalism is in it for themselves. The workers are going to work because they enjoy the work, they enjoy the work. Because they get paid for the work, because they get paid for it, so that they can take care of themselves and their family. Very few people get up in the morning and say, oh joy, I'm going to go to work so the world can be a better place. That's just not how capitalists function. They go to work because they love it, because it's fun, it's exciting. They go to work because they want to make a lot of money. They go to work because it's what they, it's the way they fulfill their lives. You know, Steve Jobs, I like to use my <laughs> iPhone because I like to show it off. And it's, a, it's one of the coolest devices I think ever made. Um, Steve Jobs didn't make this in order to make the world a better place. He made this to make Apple a more profitable, successful company. He made this because he had a passion for beautiful, effective, efficient products. He made this because he believed in it. He believed in it. He wanted to see the, the manifestation and reality of a product of his imagination or his engineer's imagination. It was all about him and Apple. And that's what motivates capitalists. A bit more than just the capitalists, i.e. providers of capital. That's what motivates most people within a capitalist economy. And I think, uh, bottom line, most people are pretty selfish most of the time. I used to have my students, uh, when, I, when I taught, I used to ask my students, how many of you, before you decided what to major in, at university, made a list of all the different professions you could do, and then ranked them based on their social, you know, what would maximize social utility, and then chose that profession that would maximize social utility. And usually there'd be one poor soul in the bag who raised 
understand. <laughs> and then it asked them, well, how many of you chose your profession based on what interested you? Based on what you wanted to do with your life? Based on what you thought would be the most fun, the most money, the most interesting, whatever. But about your values. And of course, everybody raises their hands for that. Because most people, or successful people, function to try to benefit their own lives as much as they can. And yet, and yet, when I say capitalism is selfish, that people under capitalism behave in some interested way, even you guys are kind of squirming in your seats. That's, that's kind of an uncomfortable thing to say. Because what have we been taught since we were little kids about being selfish? I mean, I know what I was taught. I come from a good Jewish family, and uh, I was always told to think of myself last, to think of others first, to take care of others. That's what morality means. Morality means the well-being of other people. And if you think about yourself, it should be the last person you think of. And to the extent that you think about yourself, at best that's amoral, and at worst it's immoral. She, she, she. You know, you, you, that's that's what the kids are taught in the sandbox. No private property in the sandbox. <laughs> I always, I always, uh, uh, you know, when I talk to, to parents, and they, uh, you know, I. They, I tell them the sharing story in the sandbox. All parents tell their kids to share their toys, and and I ask them, don't 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 you think your kids get the hypocrisy? If some stranger knocked on your door and asked to use your automobile, your car for 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 the day to share your car, how many people would let them? One. <laughs> um, there's always one. Uh, <laughs> nobody would. You're not going to let just a stranger drive off in your car. Um, yet, you're going to ask your kid to share his stories with the stranger every single time. Why? Because we still have an idealized vision of kids. And our ideal is some kind of commune in which we invite everybody to share with all our stuff. And now we as adults, we're too cynical to actually do it, right, because it doesn't work. <laughs> so we won't do it with ourselves, but we project idealism onto our kids and ask them to be idealistic communists, even though we won't do, be that. Because as, as, that is the ethic that is in our culture. The ethic of our culture is around placing the well-being of others first. Altruism. Altruism doesn't mean being nice. doesn't mean being friendly and polite. And, and being willing to trade, it means being selfless. It means self-sacrifice. Sacrificing oneself for others. It means, in the literal translation, is otherism. Altruism is otherism. It's an ism around, you know, it's a theory of others, not of yourself. Self is less. Now, in my view, that morality, that idea of what is good and what is moral is incompatible with capitalism. Capitalism is about self. Now, does that mean that the, the traditional idea of selfishness, that, you know, what, what are we taught that selfishness is? That it's, uh, you know, it's lying, stealing, cheating, doing whatever it takes. Well, I mean, those of us who are, you know, who actually trade out there in the, in the real world know that blind stealing, cheating, just at the very minimal, just doesn't work. You don't do well in business by lying, stealing, or cheating. And indeed, I would argue that in general in life, the most anti-selfish thing you could do is lie, steal, or cheat. It hurts you more than it hurts anybody else. It's a disaster. I mean, I'm sure you've all told the lie at some point in your life. It's not a good idea. It messes up, you know, your relationships. It messes up your thinking. It messes up your ability to function in the real world. The real world is the truth. Now, I find, you know, as, as we get older, I find that it's hard enough for me to remember what actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind if I have to remember what actually happened in the lives. <laughs> You know, it, one, of, one of the ways you, you make yourself a more efficient thinker is to just focus on facts, just the truth, and leave all the rest aside. That's what being self-interested and selfish really means. Yet, 
a culture that is driven by altruism, where altruism is the dominant ethic, I think is always looking for the flaw in capitalism. Because those bankers are clearly selfish. We know that. And we can't deny it. And the bankers try to deny it, but nobody believes that. And yet, in our culture, selfishness equals lying, stealing, cheating. So when they do, when one of them lies, steals, and cheats, what happens? We go, see, told you so. If one of them does it, they all must be crooks. And let's regulate all of them, which is one of the ways in which we get regulations. Time and time again, Sarbanes-Oxley in the United States is massive regulation of all business that was passed in, uh, in uh, 2002, I think it was. Um, and, it, and it came as a result of Enron. You know, there were some bad guys in Enron who, did, who committed fraud. But the extrapolation was, see, told you so. If you leave them alone, this is how selfish people behave. Therefore, we need to control everybody. All businessmen, the innocent businessmen, have to suffer for the sins of a few. But that comes out of this suspicion of anything self-interested. It comes out of this morality that we're all ingrained with. It is part of the fabric of the culture we live in that is going to be time and time again suspicious of capitalism, suspicious of markets, suspicious of self-interested behavior. And therefore, Ayn Rand argued, I would argue, that if we are to defend free markets, if we are to defend capitalism, we need to acknowledge the nature of capitalism and be willing to defend the morality that underlies it. We need to be proud to be defenders of selfishness properly defined. We need to be proud to defend self-interest properly defined. And for that, we need to, we need to reject this notion of altruism and what altruism means. We need, we, I don't think, well, I know, we cannot win the case for capitalism if we play into the, the hands of a morality that is in principle opposed to capitalism. And too often defenders of capitalism have tried to do this. Uh, the conservatives, and, and I'm not talking about the British conservatives, the American conservatives, although I think many of the British conservatives suffer from the same, same problem. The conservatives in the U.S. think capitalism is a great economic system. They get it. They get how it creates wealth and how people are better off under it. But they find it distasteful because it's focused on self-interest. So, for example, Irvin Kristol, a famous American neoconservative, wrote a book called Two Cheers for Capitalism. Now, why only two cheers? Why not three? Because it's a system that promotes self-interest and selfishness. Not only that, it rewards it, right? If you make if you make a lot of money for film, you get big bonuses. You, you're encouraged to make more money, to be more successful. I mean, CO pay, bonuses, all of that are rewards for selfish activity, for being self-interested. So Robin Crystal said, no, I cannot give capitalism a third cheer. It's a good system, it works economically well, but it's a little distasteful. Now, I don't think you can really defend capitalism uh, based on that. The, the, uh, a friend of Urban Crystal's, uh, um, Michael Novak, um, uh, gave a talk in Asia about the virtues of capitalism. And he goes through the whole talk about how wonderful capitalism, how good it is. And he gets on the last segment. He says, look, even though it produces all this wealth and it's really good and everybody benefits, you know, Urban Crystal gives it two cheers. I don't really think it deserves that. One cheer is good enough. <laughs> And this is in a big speech defending capitalism. This is the conservatives. Um, they're altruists. They bought into altruism. They believe in altruism. They committed altruists. They cannot mesh that with their, with their understanding of capitalism. And they try a balancing act. And, the reason, and, and as a consequence, what happened to the conservative movement in the United States is it drifts leftward. It drifts towards the left. Because whose who's, uh, economic system fits perfectly? with altruism, or the socialists. They're collectivists, they're oriented towards others, sharing, all of that, far more consistent with socialism. The conservatives know this deep down, 
and they're willing to continuously compromise on capitalism and continuously drift leftwards. That has been the history of American politics for the last hundred years, how the right has moved left. You know, there are a few blips in the other direction, but the systemic, the long-term projection is leftwards. And I think the cause of that is the fact that they never bought into the ethics associated with capitalism. The libertarians, on the other hand, tend to avoid all discussion of ethics altogether. That's not for them. That's philosophy. We start with liberty. We start with the non-initiation of force. We're not interested in morality. And I think by doing that, many libertarians have given up on the real battle for capitalism. Because, again, I believe the real battle is not at the level of the non-initiation of force. I think you have to prove the non-initiation of force. I don't think the non-initiation of force, non-initiation of force is this idea that as long as we don't initiate force against one another, then well, everything's fine. And the government doesn't initiate force, that's fine. But how do you convince people that that's a good idea? Most altruists think that initiating force is fine. As long as you're making another person better. For example, taxes are a good use way to initiate force because you've got too much, he's got too little, what can be immoral about me taking some of your money and giving it to him? That seems like a completely reasonable thing to do if you're an altruist. Libertarians can't win the argument just on the basis of politics. In order to win this argument, we have to go to morality. We have to argue against altruism as an ethical system, against the notion of selflessness, against the notion of self-sacrifice. And for the notion of what Ayn Rand defined as rational egoism, rational self-interest, rational selfishness. And, and let me just spend a couple of minutes you know, outlining what that actually means, and I encourage you to, to, to read Ayn Rand, um, read some of her nonfiction essays in which she deals with this in more detail. But this is not about the lying, stealing, and cheating. This is about figuring out. And, and this is hard work, being, in my view, being Self-interested is very hard work. Because it's not about life stealing cheating. It's not about doing whatever you feel like doing. Because feelings are not tools of cognition. Just because I feel like doing something doesn't make it good for me. Being rationally self-interested means really thinking through, figuring out what is really good for me over the long term, over the scope of my life. What are the actions, what are the values and the virtues that I need to hold over the span of my life to make me the best person I can be, the happiest person I can be, the most successful person I can be? That takes thinking. It takes hard work. It's not about being driven by your emotions. It's not about you know, lying, stealing, cheating, which are, which are anti-productive, anti anti-selfish actions. It's about really figuring out what makes you happy and how one goes about achieving that. It's about figuring out how to be productive, how to make a living, and going about figuring out how to do that as well as one can do. So in my view, if we're going to defend capitalism, if we're going to save capitalism for clearly, in the US at least, a clear leftist drift, it's, I think, slow, but it's a clear left-wing drift, um, we need to start advocating not just for the economics of capitalism, which I think, by the way, the economic arguments for capitalism were made you know, as well 50 years ago as they are today. You know, the, the Austrian economists, uh, you know, some of the Chicago economists have solved, I think, the puzzles from an economic perspective. There's nothing new in economics, I think, that needs to be done in order to save capitalism. We need to start together with those economic arguments that need to continue to be made. We need to start making these moral arguments. We need to fight for something that people are still quite uncomfortable with, this notion of rational self-interest. This notion, and I think, at least in America, I think it's a little more difficult in Europe. Uh, America has this wonderful political heritage. Uh, it has as its founding document, a document that has, uh, I think, in, in the most profound uh, political statement in, in human history. It has a statement that each one of us has an inalienable right to our own life, our own liberty, 
and in the most selfish political state in the history of mankind. Each one of us has a right to pursue our own happiness. Not the happiness of the community, not the state, not anybody else, but our own happiness. The right to pursue happiness is, is profound. And I think that that's what, you know, that's what the pro-capitalist movement, at least in the states, needs to latch onto that. Because Americans still believe in that to some extent. And if we can give that content, if we can give that a philosophical grounding, I think this is winnable, this, this battle that we're all fighting, uh, or, or many of us are fighting for more freedom, more capitalism, you know, uh, freer markets. So I hope you all join me. Uh, read more Ayn Rand. Uh, educate yourself about these moral issues. I think they're really crucial. Um, and let's bring the debate, let's make this debate deeper. Let's make this debate not just about the economics, a debate I think we won a long time ago. Let's make this debate about morality. And if we do, I think the future is ours. Thank you. I think that Adam Smith will be intrigued, but perhaps disturbed by your arguments. Uh, because um, while we don't owe our dinner to the altruism of the brewer or the baker, as he might have said, um, it's not entirely for self-interest that we pull a drowning child out of a river. What's the answer? Well, I do think it's in our self-interest that we pull a drowning child out of the river under, under certain circumstances, and I think there are certain circumstances where you wouldn't pull a child out of, a, out of the drowning river. Um, you know, in circumstances where you are sure to die and it's not your child, it's not clear that that's the appropriate action or that's an action that most of us would take. Um, but I think I think it is it is uh, Adam Smith presents the best um, the best of the uh, alternative case for capitalism, uh, a case that I think has failed. I, I hate to say Smith, but, that's here. <laughs> but um, I do think it is a problem. It, it's a problem that we need to face because ultimately the justification for capitalism that Adam Smith provides, that I think many defenders of liberty have provided, is the social well-being aspect. Ultimately, it's a form of utilitarianism. And I think that that is a, a uh, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a case that is not winnable. It is a case that once you accept that uh, there's some kind of social utility function out there that we're trying to maximize, now you can have lots of arguments and a lot of debates on how to calculate the social utility. Uh, who gets to say, who gets say in calculating it? There is no principal guidance in terms of what a political system should look like under the utilitarian uh, system. And I think the fact that that argument has been around for several hundreds of years now um, and, and is, I don't think, gaining traction, I think quite losing traction, uh, is to me suggests that the utilitarian argument has been won by the left, not by the pro-capitalist elements, and we need a better argument, which I think Ayn Rand provides. Um, why would you uh, jump into a river to save uh, a drowning child? Why is it in your self-interest, under certain circumstances, to do that? Because human life is, is a value to you. Um, every human being is a potential ally to you, is a potential productive person, is a potential, you know, wonderful thing. I mean, we take care of plants in our homes because we love life. We like to see them blossom. We like to see them grow. Life is a value. If we're willing to water plants, a child is much more valuable than a plant. I would certainly jump into the river to save the child now, you know, under, under the, right, the right circumstances. Uh, but I don't think it's a moral obligation. Uh, when they had the American election, uh, I wondered if uh, the Republicans moved to the religious right, if that actually put people off, uh, you know. With, um, so this, uh, the, the Republicans have moved towards a religious right to what extent that put people up. I, I think it did. I think there's no question that the Republicans have become a party that is, um, that owes its success, to the extent it has success, to the religious right, and, and therefore has alienated much of the population. Uh, the evangelicals, unfortunately, dominate the internal process within the Republican Party where candidates are chosen. See, even though those candidates are often not appealing to the general population, they get the nomination from the Republican Party because they appeal to the internal, uh, the internal mechanism. 
My personal view is that the religious right is the greatest threat to liberty in the United States today, much more so than Obama and the left. Partially because the religious right is fundamentally leftist, not rightist when it comes to economic policy. I think you saw that, um, I don't know how many of you follow American politics, but you saw that with the candidacy of, of uh, Mike Huckabee, who was the candidate of the religious right, very much a populist when it came to economics, anti-free trade, anti-immigration, anti-Wall Street, um, and you know, and, and very, very much wanting to move the party leftwards when it came to the economic, and at the same time wanting to control our lives, you know, when it came to personal choices, uh, and wanted to actually, actually at some point, said that he wanted to rewrite the American Constitution so that religion played a bigger role in it than it does uh, does today. And then actually, Palin, uh, who was uh, McCain's uh, choice for uh, vice president, played the same kind of the same kind of role, try to get evangelicals by appealing to religion, but her economics were very popular. You know, McCain and Palin started every speech attacking the oil companies and the drug companies, big oil and big drugs. So the people who provide the lifeline of Western civilization, who run everything runs on, and the people who make us better when we get sick and, and have the potential to prolong human life you know, who, who knows by how many decades if they're left free. Those are the enemies that the Republicans need to, need to be against. Uh, I think that wing of the Republican Party is very dangerous. I think it's growing in influence. I think that the Republicans, if anything, have moved more to the wars of religious right and going to move more towards the religious right after the defeat in this election. There's a battle going on within the Republican Party right now between kind of the free market people and the religious conservatives. The religious conservatives clearly have the upper hand. It's going to be a real struggle over the next eight years of an Obama administration to see who wins that struggle. But if the religious right wins, then you know I'm not sure where hope for America lies because it certainly doesn't lie with the Democrats. But there'll be not, nothing left of the Republicans. Yes, uh, brains to talk. Can I just uh, ask a question, which uh, is I'm sure will become as meat and drink to uh, an objectivist. Uh, is, is that one of the problems with people's understanding about what's happened in the financial markets over the last 18 months, two years, is the fact that amongst, even amongst the supposedly intelligent members of the public is the ability to make abstractions and to understand cause and effect. So your point about central banks pumping the world full of cheap money, not just the Federal Reserve, but the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, which said virtually no interest rates at all the last 10 years, is that most people can't work out the connections. And it's not because they're stupid, it's because the narrative, to want to use a terrible new labor expression, is that we are seeing the demise of unregulated capitalism. And of course, anybody who works in financial markets will know that there's nothing unregulated about it at all. You've got Sardines, obviously, you've got the European Union, you've got God knows how many regulations. Anyone who's worked in banks will tell you how regulated it is. So how does, um, how do you think that the, that, that the, that, that the, your, the correct interpretation of events can be more effectively put across? Because if you open any mainstream newspaper or magazine or TV channel, you, 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 the same old message is, we are seeing a demise of unregulated capitalism. It's completely rubbish, but unfortunately it's very difficult to, and no one seems to be, or very few people, apart from yourselves and a few others, seem to be trying to counteract it. I, absolutely, and, and I think the way to counteract it is to speak up. And I think the first thing that we, you know, before we get to any of the more complex issues, before we get to the moral issues or anything like that, the first thing we have to make, the first claim we have to make, is there is no such thing as unregulated capitalism. There is no such thing. This cannot be a failure of capitalism because capitalism isn't out there. The left has taken the word capitalism. I mean, it used to be that everybody was for capitalism. Why? Because it was this mixed economy. You could have a little bit more socialism, a little bit less socialism. But if you accepted this mixed economy as capitalism, then nobody's against it. Everybody's for it, right? Because nobody's for pure socialism. And if the mixed economy is capitalism, Clinton was a capitalist. Obama would say he's pro capitalism. What we need is to capture what capitalism really means. So what I try to do when I go on television, when I write something, is first, this is what capitalism is. Capitalism means unregulated free markets. Now, how many of you think our markets are unregulated? Nobody even, nobody really thinks that. But unless it's pointed out to them, they, their mind doesn't go there. Because you're right, the narrative is, to use that horrible word, but the narrative is, the no, this is how you're supposed to think about these things. What we need to do is change the narrative. We need to start asking questions, and you can do it by just asking questions. Where is this unregulated capitalism? Where are these unregulated banks? Do you realize how many lines of regulation there are in the, in the U.S. You know, 
bank regulation bills that every aspect of a bank's functioning is regulated. Every aspect. You know, from the fact that in the US we have deposit insurance, now of course you in the UK have unlimited deposit insurance. So I we don't care where we put our money, which bank is put our money, because the government guarantees it all, so we don't have to think about who's safe and who's not. Make us all brain dead right off the bat. Of course, that creates huge moral hazard on the part of the bankers. The bankers, as they get into more financial distress, have a great incentive to take on more and more risk because it's not their capital, it's not their money anymore, it's depositors, and the depositors don't care because they government guarantee it. It's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon in the U.S. that you know I noticed back in the 80s. Uh, in the 80s, the U.S. went through the SNL crisis, the saving and loan crisis, where these as, as saving and loans were going bankrupt and right. And what was fascinating is that the Wall Street Journal used to publish a little chart, it, which was which SNLs around the country were offering the highest rates on accounts, on checking accounts, saving accounts, CDs, money markets. And um, they would see, of course, people want high returns. People would send them huge quantities of money because they were offering high returns. Of course, that chart was predictive, almost at 100% of which banks were going to go back. Within six months, most of the ones on this chart were bankrupt. So why were people sending the money to a bankrupt to an institution on the verge of bankruptcy? Because we don't care because it's all guaranteed by the government. Now, what do you think those bankers were doing when they got this money that they, in those days, they were paying 10, 12% on some of the money? Well, they had to now invest it in ventures that they expected to get 15, 20, 25% on. Now, what kind of ventures get those kind of returns? Well, very, very risky. I call it, they were basically buying lottery tickets. And once in a while, one of these banks won the lottery, and they're the survivors. Most of them lost the money. And that's why most SNLs went out of existence during the 1980s and 1990s. But the mechanism to make that happen is created by them. So just pointing out all these little regulatory aspects, what kind of loans bank can make, you know, the, the very fact that the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve set the interest rates. Uh, all of those, we just need to keep keep conveying this message. What failed is not capitalism. What failed is not capitalism. Even if you don't make the positive point about what really caused the crisis is, is a central bank, just enough to get, get the narrative changed. And it's going to take a lot of work because we're outnumbered. You know, we just are. The, the, and, and unfortunately... I've seen so many free market economists crumble with this crisis, you know, uh, ch suddenly change their stripes or, or turn the other way. I happen to think that uh, a big part of that is this moral uncomfortableness with, with the idea of, of, of capitalism that causes people to switch. Yes, uh, I'm probably one of the in-house objectivists at ESI over the years, <laughs> having spoken on Ayn Rand's 100th anniversary. Uh, what would you regard as the role of government in an objective society, and in particular foreign policy and defense? Um, so I think the role of government is the role of government is uh, police uh, to protect us against criminals uh, and to protect against um, against fraud. A judicial system, a judiciary that arbitrates disputes and, of course, pr prosecutes those who committed fraud and committed uh, crimes. And a, a military that is protect us from foreign invasion, from terrorist attacks, from uh, you know uh, foreign violation of, of our property rights. And, and you know, I think I think there's an open debate at which point uh, violation of American, let's say we're talking about America, of America's property rights overseas would justify would justify a military intervention. I think that's a, a debatable issue at what point that happens, but I certainly think there is a point in which massive confiscation by a foreign government of American property is justification enough for U.S. to use a military force in order to protect the individual rights of its citizens. So the overarching idea is the role of government is to protect the individual rights. The individual rights of it's citizens. That's why we have nations, rather than the individual rights of all citizens all over the world. American government is set to protect the individual rights of Americans. The UK government is set to protect the individual rights of the British. Now, if, if, if all governments are doing a good job at that, then, you know, they all look the same and uh, there's not much difference between them. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that kind of circumstances. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, I, I get a sense that you're asking more in terms of the foreign policy. Uh, but I think uh, the a government is set to protect its citizens. So if it's attacked, 
Its job is to defeat the enemy as thoroughly, as quickly, with as few casualties to itself as possible, and then bring the troops home. So my view is crush the enemy and come back home. No nation building, no martial plans, no helping establish democracy in the world as, as uh, you know, uh, Bush would have liked. Um, no setting up puppet governments overseas. You go in, you penalize the people who've, who've inflicted, you know, who've, who've violated your rights, and, and you get out of there as soon as feasibly possible. Again, the criteria for all those actions is, what is the action necessary to protect the individual rights of your citizens while minimizing the risk to your own citizens? How many will reconcile uh, the Israeli objective in the democracy? Maybe we need to place the mass of people, the majority of people, if they don't buy that. So I, sure, so how do I reconcile objectivism with democracy? Um, I don't. Um, I'm against democracy. If democracy is understood as majority rule, that is, I'm against the Athenian style of democracy where they don't like what Socrates has said, so they all get together in the arena and they vote to execute. And of course, Socrates takes the poison because he believes in democracy too, and the people have spoken. Uh, and Plato's sophisticated escape plan goes to waste. Um, so I, I'm against majority rule, and I think this is why defining the role of government is so crucial. If we define the role of government as protecting individual rights, then no majority should ever be allowed to violate somebody's rights. The fact that 51% of the people want me silenced gives them no way to actually do it. Um, the fact that 51% of my neighbors want uh, me to keep the trees and I want to chop them down gives them no way to do it. Of course, in the U.S. today, and I'm sure in many other countries, they can. My neighbors can decide what kind of house, what it, whether I go down to my house, whether I chop down a tree or not. All of that is decided democratically in the United States. America has moved towards democracy. The whole idea of a right to property is an anti-democratic notion. It says that 51% of the people can't vote my property away from me. Eminent domain, right, which is democracy is applied to property rights. Uh, freedom of speech says 51% can't silence me. 99% of the people can't silence me. That's so, I'm a strong believer in, in constitutional republic, uh, you know, in the, in the context and framework like the founding fathers of the US established it, where they are individual rights, nobody can take them away from you. No majority, no democracy. The things people could vote on are very limited. They can vote on their representatives, and their representatives can do very few things. You know, things like a clearer definition of what property rights actually mean. Property rights are an evolving concept. The new challenges to property rights continuously. We need a legislature to continuously define and look at how do you define property rights over the internet? How do you define property rights over minerals? Uh, you know, they, they, they went a long way in the 19th century, for example, property rights, and at some point in the, in the late 19th century, all new thinking about property rights basically stopped. And, and today we don't have property rights. Today it's just whatever the community wants. So um, I think we need to get away from democracy and, and towards protection of individual rights, and away from majority rule, and towards people voting on very narrow things, only things that are not violations of other people's rights. Okay. Yes. First, can you say a few words about Ron Paul? Yes. And secondly, presumably, uh, with the views you've articulated, you would be very much against legislating against Holocaust denial. Sorry, okay, the second one is easy. I, I'm definitely against legislating against Holocaust denial. So if somebody wants to deny the Holocaust, they, have, they should have complete freedom to do so. I think it's despicable, but you know that's that's just a, you know the legislation has no role here. Freedom of speech is absolute. Um, Ron Paul is a little bit more complicated. I, I really dislike Ron Paul quite strongly, uh, which will come as a surprise I think to many of you. Um, I think Ron Paul is is the the the, the you know a, a, the wrong kind of combination of libertarian, uh, which which combines. Uh, a strong religiosity, and as a consequence, an unwillingness, for example, to take a stand on on, a, on, a, on abortion, or, or you know, fudge your stand on abortion by saying it should be left up to states, i.e., democracy. I claim it's an individual right. Whatever side you fall on it, 
It's an individual rights question. It's either you're violating individual rights or you're not, and it should be an absolute yes or no. It shouldn't be up for a vote. I, I happen to think that abortion is fine, and and uh, and it, it's the mother has rights and the, and the fetus does not. But whatever you fall in, it, it's an individual rights. Take a stand. Um, is very accommodating on religion, uh, and, and Ron Paul is 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 quite religious himself. Um, I also dislike his foreign policy a lot. Uh, I think that that uh, Ron Paul and, and many in the American libertarian movement came out strongly uh, with this idea that 9/11 was America's fault. Uh, it was somehow our presence in the Middle East or something like that that caused this. I disagree with that. I don't have the time here to go into it, but I disagree with that strongly. I think. The notion that America should apologize after 9/11, which is what many of uh, many of these uh, wanted, many of these libertarians wanted, I think is horrific. Uh, you know, I call it. There's a certain <coughs> wing, and I'll, I'll leave it at a certain wing in the libertarian movement. It came out of Marie Rothbard, which is anti-American in a very, very deep sense. I mean, Marie Rothbard comes out in, in sections for the Soviet Union over America. It, it, they hate government so much because they're anarchists. They hate government so much that they project that hatred on the American government more than they do on any other government in the world. And I think that's what led them to, to blame everything. Every crisis in the world was America for all season. And Ron Paul, unfortunately, I think comes from that tradition. Uh, and, and so I opposed him. And also, and now I love the fact that in a debate he could say there shouldn't be a Federal Reserve. That was fabulous. Uh, and there's certain things that he said that, that were just great, but he also carries this other baggage that I'm not really Promise those last four so. Uh, okay. One sentence, no punctuation, and everyone <coughs> take more points. <laughs> yes. I've got a very simple question. Are you, are, are you optimistic? I, oh, you want to take all the questions? I can't even remember. The I'll, I'll remember the points. Okay. So optimism. Um, socialism is not compatible with altruism because I'm forced to pay taxes. It's not altruistic at all. Secondly, I agree that the present crisis is a catastrophic failure of monetary policy. But if we didn't have central banks, would it have been avoided? And the last one there. The emotional hook for your narrative. You need an emotional hook as well as a <laughs> logical, rational hook. Otherwise, you won't be able to land it. I, yeah, just that okay. last. Alan, we spoke about rights and foreign policy. I was wondering what the status would be on torture regarding this. So they be torturing the Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, how about we do this? Let's let's leave emotion and torch and not torch, emotion and optimism to last because you want to end on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do socialism torture and then <laughs> so no, there's nothing in altruism that says that it has to be voluntary. Otherism does not require you to voluntarily sacrifice. Uh, it's fine to force people to sacrifice. There's nothing in the Christian ethic, there's nothing in the Jewish ethic, there's nothing in the Islamic ethic, there's nothing in the Kantian ethic that suggests volunteers. If, if, I, if I think you're not giving enough to the poor, it's completely fine for me to force you to give more, and you'll still land up in heaven as a consequence. So the fact that you were forced to do it doesn't, doesn't change its moral status necessarily. Um, but the other orientation is consistent with socialism. Socialism, you can sell socialism with altruism much easier than you can sell capitalism with altruism. Capitalism is unaltruistic, even though it's voluntary, even though it's charitable, even though people give more under capitalism to charity than they would under any other system. They're far more pro-life, pro-charity, pro-people than under any other system. Their motivation is not altruistic, it's selfish fundamentally, even when they do charity, and as a consequence, you know, if you're an altruist, capitalism is up. That's a quick answer. <laughs> um, torture. Um, how many of you watch 24? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a certain percentage of you watch 24. Um, there's no question in my mind that in, under certain circumstances, life or death circumstances, torture is absolutely moral. Not only that, I would argue that it's a moral necessity. That not to torture somebody. When you know that torturing them will save lives, when you know that that person is a bad guy, I'm assuming that, right, that the tortured person is a bad guy, you know the person is a bad guy, and lives will be saved if you don't, then it would be immoral not to torture him, because then these people are dying. Now, I'm also assuming something else, that torture is effective. I have no opinion one way or the other about that. That's a technical question. You'd have to ask the experts. I think it is. 
but that's just a personal opinion. You know, a little bit based on the fact that I used to, I, I served in Israeli military intelligence a long time ago. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't actually do any torture, I promise. No. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example, and, and actually this comes from a, a leftist, Alan Dershowitz, uh, who's an American leftist, uh, but has written on torture. And, and this example is, you know, you make it personal. Make it personal. Your child has got a bomb strapped in, and the terrorist is right in front of him, and only he can dismantle the bomb. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to get that terrorist to dismantle the bomb? So my question is about terrorist suspects as opposed to known terrorists, because I think that's usually where the... the well, I mean, yeah, there, so there, there's no question there are gray areas here. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't talk to somebody you don't know, but um, look, in 20, I, that's why I like 24, I like, uh, because it presents these kind of moral dilemmas. There's a nuke going off in Los Angeles right now. You've got a person that you're convinced 80% is responsible. He's the only one who can dismantle the nuke. If the nuke goes up, 50,000 people are going to die. What do you do? Well, there's a certain point where, you, you know, if he's innocent, then you can, you know, there's no, torturing will be ineffective. It would be stupid to waste the time. You've got a bomb to dismantle. Um, at some point, it becomes the only practical thing to do. It's great, and that's why it should only be in, under extraordinary circumstances. And, you know, I, I, I but I think it's, left to the experts to make those kind of evaluations. And so I don't rule torture out, is my point. But I certainly don't suggest that every criminal should be tortured, or, or every suspect of a crime should be tortured. Um, emotion and optimism. Emotion and optimism. optimism. <laughs> um, I am optimistic. Um, and uh, I do believe that we need to make an emotional case uh, for capitalism. And as you can see, I'm a pretty emotional guy. Um, and I think we can make an emotional case. I think we have to make the rational case, but we can do it with passion, first of all. Secondly, I go back to this notion of, of the pursuit of happiness. At least in America, we can hook people with this idea of here's a morality that completely justifies, provides a, a basis in philosophy and morality for your pursuing your happiness. You don't have to feel guilty for being successful. You don't have to feel guilty for working hard at taking your care of your family and not worrying too much about starving kids in Africa. You shouldn't feel guilty about those things. Americans at least, and, and I think I think generally human beings, respond positively to that message of self-fulfillment, self-actualization, happiness, individual happiness, taking care of oneself and one family. I think that is the message that needs to be conveyed. And the capitalism, is a system that allows them to do that. It's the only system that leaves them free to pursue their own happiness. That's something people can really grasp onto and relate to. And the reason I'm happiness is, is because of that. People still respond positively to that message. And, you know, I believe that Ayn Rand is probably the best communicator of these ideas ever. And part of my optimism is the fact that uh, through many of our programs, we believe that about a million kids in the United States every year are reading Ayn Rand. Uh, Ayn Rand sales in the bookstores, unrelated to our own activities. Ayn Rand sales at the bookstores, she sells somewhere close to double what she sold when she was alive. So I was sure sells about double the number of copies today, every day, in the bookstores. But then when there was a bestseller, New York Times bestseller in 1957 when it first came out, uh, the growth rate is clearly upwards. More and more people are talking about her ideas. Uh, more and more people are taking her seriously. Today there is a chair in the philosophy of objectivism at the University of Texas in Austin, a, a top 20 philosophy department in, in, in the world, has a chair in the philosophy of objectivism. There are regular seminars among philosophers to talk about her ideas. Uh, you know, there, there are at least some, well, somewhere between 50 to 100 universities in the United States where Ayn Rand is being taught on a regular basis. So I am very optimistic because I think these are powerful ideas. And if we can expose enough people to them, people respond positively to them. Our enemy is ignorant. And if we're getting these ideas out there, if, we, if people are reading the books, if people are being engaged with these ideas, then I cannot help but believe that we will win. Thank you all.